Book Second, Chapter Fifth of Ben Hur by Lou Wallace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five. The young Israelite proceeded then and rehearsed his conversation with Messala, dwelling with particularity upon the latter's speeches in contempt of the Jews, their customs, and much pent round of life. Afraid to speak the while, the mother listened, discerning the matter plainly. Judah had gone to the palace in the marketplace, allured by love of a playmate, whom he thought to find exactly as he had been in the parting years before. A man met him, and, in place of laughter and references to the sport of the past, the man had been full of the future, and talked of glory to be won, and of riches and power. Unconscious of the effect, the visitor had come away hurt in pride, yet touched with a natural ambition. But she, the jealous mother, sought and not knowing the turn the aspiration might take, became at once Jewish in her fear. What if it lured him away from the patriarchal faith? In her view, the consequence was more dreadful than any or all others. She could discover but one way to avert it, and she set about the task, her native power reinforced by love to such degree that her speech took a masculine strength, and at times a poet's fervor. There never has been a people, she began, who did not think themselves at least equal to any other never a great nation my son that did not believe itself the very superior when the roman looks down upon israel and laughs he merely repeats the folly of the egyptians the assyrian and the macedonian and as the laugh is against god the result will be the same her voice became firmer there is no law by which to determine the superiority of nations hence the vanity of the claim and the idleness of disputes about it a people risen and die either of themselves or at the hands of another who succeeding to their power take possession of their place and upon their monuments write new names such is history if i were called upon to symbolize god and man in the simplest form i would draw a straight line and a circle and of the line i would say this is god for he alone moves forever straight forward and of the circle this is man, such is his progress. I do not mean that there is no difference between the careers of nations. No two are alike. The difference, however, is not, as some say, in the extent of the circle they describe, or the space of earth they cover, but in the sphere of their movement, the highest being nearest God. To stop here, my son, would be to leave the subject where we began. Let us go on. There are signs by which to measure the height of the circle each nation runs while in its course. By them let us compare the Hebrew and the Roman. The simplest of all the signs is the daily life of the people. Of this I will only say, Israel has at times forgotten God, while the Roman never knew him. Consequently, comparison is not possible. Your friend, or your former friend, charged if i understood you rightly that we have no poets artists or warriors by which he meant i suppose to deny that we had had great men the next most certain of the signs a just consideration of this charge requires a definition at the commencement a great man o oh my boy is one whose life proves him to have been recognized if not called by god a Persian was used to punish our recreant fathers, and he carried them into captivity. Another Persian was selected to restore their children to the Holy Land. Greater than either of them, however, was the Macedonian through whom the desolation of Judea and the temple was avenged. The special distinction of the men was that they were chosen by the Lord, each for a divine purpose, and that they were Gentiles does not lessen their glory. Do not lose sight of this definition while I proceed. There is an idea that war is the most noble occupation of men, and that the most exalted greatness is the growth of battlefields. Because the world has adopted the idea, be not you deceived. That we must worship something is a law which will continue as long as there is anything we cannot understand. The prayer of the barbarian is a wail of fear addressed to strength, the only divine quality he can clearly conceive. Hence his faith in heroes." What is Jovi but a Roman hero? The Greeks have their great glory because they were the first to set mind above strength. In Athens the orator and philosopher were more revered than the warrior. 
the charioteer and the swiftest runner are still idols of the arena yet the immortelles are reserved for the sweetest singer the birthplace of one poet was contested by seven cities but was the helena the first to deny the old barbaric faith no my son that glory is ours against brutalism our fathers erected god in our worship the wail of fear gave place to the hosanna and the psalm so the hebrew and the greek would have carried all humanity forward and upward but alas the government of the world presumes war as an eternal condition wherefore over mind and above god the roman has enthroned his caesar the absorbent of all attainable power the prohibition of any other greatness the sway of the greek was a flowering time for genius in return for the liberty it then enjoyed what a company of thinkers the mind led forth there was a glory for every excellence and a perfection so absolute that in everything but war even the roman has stooped to imitation a greek is now the model of the orators in the forum listen and in every roman song you will hear the rhythm of the greek if a roman opens his mouth speaking wisely of moralities or abstractions or of the mysteries of nature he is either a plagiarist or the disciple of some school which had a greek for its founder in nothing but war i say again has rome a claim of originality her games and spectacles are greek inventions dashed with blood to gratify the ferocity of her rabble her religion if such it may be called is made up of contributions from the fates of all other peoples her most venerated gods are from olympus even her mars and for that matter the jovi she much magnifies so it happens o oh my son that of the whole world our israel alone can dispute the superiority of the greek and with him contest the palm of original genius to the excellencies of other peoples the egotism of a roman is a blindfold impenetrable as his breastplate o oh, the ruthless robbers under their trampling the earth trembles like a floor beaten with flails along with the rest we are fallen alas that i should say it to you my son they have our highest places and the holiest and the end no man can tell but this i know they may reduce judea as an almond broken with hammers and devour jerusalem which is the oil and sweetness thereof yet the glory of the men of israel will remain a light in the heavens overhead out of reach for their history is the history of god who wrote with their hands spake with their tongues and was himself in all the good they did even the least who dwelt with them a lawgiver on sinai a guide in the wilderness in war a captain in government a king who once and again pushed back the curtains of the pavilion which is his resting-place intolerably bright and as a man speaking to men showed them the right and the way to happiness and how they should live and made them promises binding the strength of his almightiness with covenants sworn to everlastingly o oh, my son could it be that they with whom jehovah thus dwelt an awful familiar derived nothing from him that in their lives and deeds the common human qualities should not in some degree have been mixed and coloured with the divine that their genius should not have in it even after the lapse of ages some little of heaven for a time the rustling of the fan was all the sound heard in the chamber in the sense which limits art to sculpture and painting it is true she next said israel has had no artists the admission was made regretfully for it must be remembered she was a sadducee whose faith unlike that of the pharisees permitted a love of the beautiful in every form and without reference to its origin still he who would do justice she proceeded will not forget that the cunning of our hands was bound by the prohibition thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything which the sophirim wickedly extended beyond its purpose and time nor should it be forgotten that long before daedalus appeared in attica and with his wooden statues so transformed sculpture as to make possible the schools of corinth and aegina and their ultimate triumphs the poetile and capitolium long before the age of daedalus i say two israelites bisalil and aholiab the master builders of the first tabernacle said to have been skilled in all manner of workmanship wrought the cherubim of the mercy seat above the ark of gold beaten not chiselled were they and they were statues in form both human and divine 
and they shall stretch forth their wings on high, and their faces shall look one to another. Who will say they were not beautiful, or that they were not the first statues? Oh, I see now why the Greek outstripped us, said Judah, intensely interested. And the ark, accursed be the Babylonians who destroyed it. Nay, Judah, be of faith. It was not destroyed, only lost, hidden away to safely in some cavern of the mountains. One day, Hillel and Shammai both say so, one day in the Lord's good time it will be found and brought forth, and Israel dance before it, singing as of old. And they who look upon the faces of the Cherubim then, though they have seen the face of the ivory Minerva, will be ready to kiss the hand of the Jew from love of his genius, asleep through all the thousands of years. The mother, in her eagerness, had risen into something like the rapidity and vehemence of a speech-maker. But now, to recover herself, or to pick up the thread of her thought, she rested a while. "'You are so good, my mother,' he said, in a grateful way, "'and I will never be done saying so. Shammai could not have talked better, nor Hillel. I am a true son of Israel again.' "'Flatterer,' she said. "'You do not know that I am but repeating what I heard Hillel say in an argument he had one day in my presence with a sophist from Rome.' well the hearty words are yours directly all her earnestness returned where was i oh yes i was claiming for our hebrew fathers the first statues the trick of the sculptor judah is not all there is of art any more than art is all there is of greatness i always think of great men marching down the centuries in groups and goodly companies separate according to nationalities here the indian there the egyptian yonder the assyrian above them the music of trumpets and the beauty of banners, and on their right hand and left, as reverent spectators, the generations from the beginning, numberless. As they go, I think of the Greek saying, Lo, the Helena leads the way. Then the Roman replies, Silence! What was your place is ours now. We have left you behind, as dust trodden on. And all the time, from the far front back, over the line of march, as well as forward into the farthest future, streams a light of which the wranglers knew nothing, except that it is for ever leading them on. The light of revelation! Who are they that carry it? Ah, the old Judean blood! How it leaps at the thought! By the light we know them! Thrice blessed! O oh, our fathers, servants of God, keepers of the covenants! Ye are the leaders of men, the living and the dead. The front is thine, and though every Roman were a Caesar, ye shall not lose it. Judah was deeply stirred. Do not stop, I pray you, he cried. You give me to hear the sound of timbrels. I wait for Miriam and the women who went after her dancing and singing. She caught his feeling, and, with ready wit, wove it into her speech. Very well, my son. If you can hear the timbrel of the prophetess, you can do what I was about to ask. You can use your fancy and stand with me, as if by the wayside, while the chosen of Israel pass us at the head of the procession. Now they come, the patriarchs first, next the fathers of the tribes. I almost hear the bells of the camels and the lowing of their herds. Who is he that walks alone between the companies? An old man, yet his eye is not dim, nor his nature force abated. He knew the Lord face to face. Warrior, poet, orator, lawgiver, prophet, his greatness is as the sun at morning, its flood of splendour quenching all other lights, even that of the first and noblest of the Caesars. After him the judges, and then the kings, the son of Jesse, a hero in war, and a singer of songs eternal as that of the sea, and his son, who, passing all other kings in riches and wisdom, and while making the desert habitable, and in its waste places planting cities, forgot not Jerusalem which the Lord had chosen for his seat on earth. Bend lower, my son. These that come next are the first of their kind, and the last. Their faces are raised, as if they heard a voice in the sky and were listening. Their lives were full of sorrows. Their garments smell of tombs and caverns. Hearken to a woman among them. Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. Nay, put your forehead in the dust before them. They were tongues of God, his servants, who looked through heaven, and, seeing all the future, wrote what they saw, and left the writing to be proved by time. Kings turned pale as they approached them, and nations trembled at the sound of their voices. The elements waited upon them. 
In their hands they carried every bounty and every plague. See the Tishpiter and his servant Elisha. See the sad son of Hilkai, and him, the seer of visions, by the river of Cheba, and of the three children of Judah, who refused the image of the Babylonian. Lo! that one who, in the feast to the thousand lords, so confounded the astrologers. And yonder, O oh my son, kiss the dust again! Yonder the gentle son of Amos, from whom the world has its promise of the Messiah to come. In this passage the fan had been kept in rapid play. It stopped now, and her voice sank low. You are tired, she said. No, he replied. I was listening to a new song of Israel. The mother was still intent upon her purpose and passed the pleasant speech in such light as i could my judah i have set our great men before you patriarchs legislators warriors singers prophets turn we to the best of rome against moses placed caesar and tarquin against david Scylla against ida of the maccabees the best of the consuls against the judges augustus against solomon and you are done comparison ends there but think then of the prophets greatest of the great she laughed scornfully. Pardon me. I was thinking of the soothsayer who warned Caius Julius against the Ides of March, and fancied him looking for the omens of evil which his master despised in the entrails of a chicken. From that picture turned to Elijah, sitting on the hilltop on the way to Samaria, amid the smoking bodies of the captains and their fifties, warning the son of Ahab of the wrath of our God, finally o oh my judah if such speech can be reverent how shall we judge jehovah and jupiter unless it be by what their servants have done in their names and as for what you shall do she spoke the letter with slowly and with a tremulous utterance as for what you shall do my boy serve the lord the lord god of israel not rome for a child of abraham there is no glory except in the lord's ways and in them there is much glory i may be a soldier then judah asked why not did not moses call god a man of war there was then a long silence in the summer chamber you have my permission she said finally if only you serve the lord instead of caesar he was content with the condition and by and by fell asleep she arose then and put the cushion under his head and throwing a shawl over him and kissing him tenderly went away End of chapter five